at this period in uh, history, and particularly my involvement in any part of it, which I must say is not at all satisfactory, I don't think any of us really feel satisfied by the progress we have made in view of the amount of things still left to be done. Uh, but one thing that I can say is that very early in what I finally did, I had the concern of my father to remind me that very rarely in history, when you're involved in a revolution, you get an opportunity to see the end of it. And in the first place, revolutions never finish. Because when you are successful and the revolution has gone to the point where the person or persons you are backing become in office, the person or persons become the target for the new revolution. So that one revolution brings another. Now, knowing that there's going to be a new revolution as soon as you secure your position, do you stop and say, since it's going to cause a new revolution, I wouldn't do anything because what's the end of it? It will be a new re revolution. No. Uh, though it is obvious that there will be a new revolution because there will be a lot of people not satisfied with the leadership of the new system that come in, it must take place because it moves us from one position to another so that there is an improvement from the last point to the next. So you don't say, well, I'm not going to pursue this because we're going to have a new revolution again because when this gets uh, steady, there will be people uh, trying to overthrow this government as they have done past governments before. It would seem that the human being or the human animal, like any other animal, operates in this manner. Whether or not the human person is conscious, we do operate as other animals. We don't want to admit that in the pecking order of animals, we are in line. Uh, because we have stated, to ourselves at least, that we are the only one who speak, of course, in human tongue. Other animals speak in their own way. I don't think anyone would expect a lion to speak as a human being. Then he wouldn't be a lion anymore. But the lions communicate with each other in attacking others and other animals not in their order. Of course, there is the, the, the argument again of the human being, the higher being. Human told themselves, ourselves, we are the higher being. Nobody told us. I had never seen a, a lion again who said to human being, I recognize that you are higher than me. But, but, but that's the way, again, the order of animal uh, uh, is. Assuming then that we do have a difference, and we do know we do have a difference, to the certain animals or most animals. We then must philosophically speak on the basis of defending or promoting that realm which we consider the human kingdom or the human uh, family or whatever name you may want to give to it. In order to be able to come at a point of this, the, the central point of this kind of proposition, we must understand what it is we are about. And in the family of human beings, we have found men divided, mankind I should say, meaning male and female, divided by color of skin, religion, uh, social status, and all kinds of different things. 
there was, it was is a tendency to make African people to be outside of these divisions, to make African people none connected with any of these a special identity. And to me, that is the worst thing could ever happen. The height of this is the result of a Michael Jackson. And most of us, a lot of us, if not most of us, would like to be Michael Jackson. Just that he had the guts enough to do it. Of course, he's crazy, but in his in mental illness, he had the nerve to do what a lot of us would do if we had that nerve and plus that money. But nevertheless, there is a concerted effort to produce more Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson remind me of Walter White. At, uh, Walter White was the hen head of the NWCP for a number of years, the executive director. And one time he made a statement that he wished that some scientists could find an injection to put in each of us that would make us white and therefore there would be no more race problem. He did not say that would make us black, but they would make <laughs> us white. Of course, a number of us, including yours truly, attacked him verbally for his statement and he apologized and said he, he said it in jest. He did not necessarily mean for this to happen in fact. But the, 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 it was in fact, that was, uh, I'm sure, uh, a Freudian slip, as they called it, by Walter White. But why would Walter White think in this way? Or anyone else? Uh, um, uh, what difference is Walter White's position than Michael Jackson or Diana Ross? Or a number of other people who think in this, in this manner of ways? It is because they, the mere suggestion comes because they themselves <coughs> have a weakness. And the basic weakness is that they find that if anything is to be done to solve this problem, then one of the things could be done is to make us less manhood, less, less African, and to become more European, or more Asian, or something else. And that's the problem that I see in this whole thing. This problem is a part of the struggle that Dr. Jeffries has because the society is now looking for him to be a Michael Jackson or a Diana Ross. And we may not see this being part of the background. We saw it in the performance of an Al Johnson uh, singing Mommy, no less so than, uh, that is no less so than uh, Jenny Wismuller playing Tarzan. Then you ask, what is the connection? The connection is in either case, it belittles the African. It, in one case, it showed the African making, being ignorant, dancing, running around looking funny. In the other case, it's showing the African's inability to function, to protect himself or themselves. In the case of Tarzan, uh, coming and without a gun, without a knife, and beating up uh, 300,000 Africans with spears, and so forth, and uh, landing or get, get, uh, getting stranded with a plane wreck, and a gorilla feeds him, and bring him to manhood, and there's a umpteen African woman there who could feed him and have fed uh, uh, quite a number of people. And this all kind of thing, just as this, it is no different than the image that we got from uh, this German fellow um, uh, that they're supposed to have done so much in Africa with the most racist prejudice he brought there. I talk about the one that they give the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, um, Christian missionary, um, Albert Schweitzer. Well, you don't hear too much about him because at least the Africans in that state 
never did consider him anything and didn't, when independence came, didn't give him any kind of award or so forth. So all, it all locks in. It locks in and we are surprised of it to the extent that when the Japanese uh, made certain remarks a few uh, times about uh, the negativity of Africans' behavior in this society, we got upset. I don't understand why. I really don't understand why you are uh, upset because the Japanese made a statement. What did you expect? Uh, did you really expect that the Japanese would come into American society, deal with America on an American basis, be honorary whites in South Africa, and then come to America and say lauding things that will make you on the same par with the Japanese? Again, the only reason you could believe so is that you're living in a fool's paradise. There's no reason at all for you to believe that the Japanese would say anything positive about you or respective about you based upon what they are in the society. They're not here as servants. They're not here in a subservient position. They are here not only as merchants and, and manufacturers, etc. They are here as the new Cornelian mass economic master which America is second class too. They, finally, they eventually made a statement known by showing they are superior in themselves. They feel superior to the European American. That it was not you alone. And you, and you now start to still ask in the, your Jesse Jackson fashion, uh, expecting that, beseeching the the, the member of, of Japanese uh, parliament who made the statement that by beseeching him to understand that you are a human being also, that he will now turn and say to you, yes, my brother, and I, I forgot, we are, all, we are all black people, this is one of your favorite nonsense, that we are all black people and we must stay together. In the first place, we are Africans. There may be other black people in the world. But they don't treat us as such. We are African people, black nevertheless, with all kinds of shades of black. But as such, we have to realize that we are a distinctly different type of people than others with our own specific, specific characteristics. And we have to fight towards the preservation of those characteristics, irrespective of what it's going to cause us. Now, I know that that is a very difficult position to take. But when you decide that you want to give up your shackles, whether it, whether it be physical or mental, you took a difficult posi a position. And, you must, and that position requires extreme behavior, including violence. Violence to the nth degree to protect ourselves, if necessary. And I'm not tying you to the statement. I am saying I, Joseph Ben Yakan, is saying this, and it binds Joseph Ben Yakan only. My statement binds myself only, or anybody wants to adopt it and then say. I adopt this or I agree with this. If you don't say it, it doesn't bind you. I want to make that clear so that when somebody hear it tomorrow, uh, they will say, well, you all didn't say it, just I said it. And I'm saying it. That, it, that the position I've taken from 1936 uh, consciously and then 1939 as I traveled internationally was one that called for killing somebody if necessary or more than one person. If I am asked by the United States Army and the United States uh, 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 Maritime Service to go out and kill for a man that is suppressing me or people that are suppressing me, who would believe that I would not equally want to kill to protect me? If I am killing and trained to kill to protect the man who has mistreated me from the time I know what daylight is, and before that, my, 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 my family and ancestors, that I too would not have the desire to kill 
for my own protection, protection, then you must not consider me human. It is human behavior to, to, to fight, to kill if necessary, to protect one's person. That's, it is called by some machination, self-preservation. It's the first order of human society. And it, that is the position that bothers all of us, is that when we have come to the conclusion, with all the stimuli that have been around us, that we are a great people, that whatever we are as a people, one of the things we must do is protect our peoplehood. In order to do this, it may be necessary to kill. And that is something we have not given consideration because we know we have been able to const uh, const con constantly satisfy ourselves by praying in, sitting in, lying in, and, and, and all the ends at lunch counters and everywhere else. Even when our mothers are whipped in front of us, our daughters, our sisters, are beaten in front of us, much less our sons, we are satisfied with a prayer. Even though we know that prayer doesn't help nobody. Prayer helps one person, I make a mistake, it helps the minister and the, and the, and the one who controls the money in, in the church or the synagogue or the mosque. It helps such persons. You don't have to ask me. Look around and see how these brothers ride and in what kind of car, whether it be Islamic, Christian, Muslim, or whatever it is. Now let's deal with it. You see? Let's deal with it. Now, uh, how, how can it continue in this manner? Because we have not made our leadership responsible to us. We have been satisfied with a black face in high place. And if you can provide us with a black face in high place, we are then satisfied. For example, let's be more specific, the mayor of the city of New York. We are willing to have the mayor of the city of New York another time because it's a black face. We have not said what that black face must represent. What qualifications to us to satisfy us? The black face must have. It's like, it's like uh, uh, I'm going to Philadelphia tomorrow to Temple University. And I recall when I was down there, there was a big argument came up one time because the dean uh, and I had it out and uh, he said that he wouldn't recognize my PhD from Cuba. And it was a big thing and nobody in the Black Studies Department except the, the, the gentleman, uh, the director that brought me there, Dr. Ayaga, and one student, nobody, all of the other teachers, the, the, the total Black Studies Department, every professor, assistant professor, associate professor in the department, not one came to my aid. I had eventually got my lawyer and had to go against the state of Pennsylvania and, uh, and then finally they agreed to pay me my money and uh, I left. But I'm going back tomorrow for the first time in uh, I think it's 15 years or whatever it is. Uh, others have come and couldn't invite me to come on the campus. That's, that's nothing because I taught at Cornell University for 18 years and at the 20th anniversary of the Africana Studies, they couldn't invite me to come. I was the only person who couldn't come because they were dignitaries, both black and white, coming to the 20th anniversary. Yet the irony is that a, a picture, a picture of myself, I think 36 inches high, and a room was being named for me. The picture was put up, but I couldn't be there. And they had somebody else to speak for me at, the, yet I was, uh, I was at, Ch at a Pan Fan restaurant when the person was saying, bye bye, I see Dr. Ben, and know that the person was coming up to speak for me also. So you understand, you must, you must but this is, you say, am I surprised, am I mad? No, this 
is to be expected because when you are in the struggle that you are now, you must expect anything. Uh, you are as close to death as I were in those days with the Ashur Shirazi party in Zanzibar. You are as close as you were when you were in Vietnam or Korea or the Second World War. If you fantasize what Dr. Jeffries is involved with is just an exercise in academics, you are very much mistaken. It is at that stage, at this point, for whatever the reason. But all the potentials of physical death are acting. What Dr. Jeffrey is going through is a continuation of a preview that we had with Jito Wayusi in Brooklyn, Dr. Hatchett in Manhattan, all started by a little a young African girl writing a poem in a contest in her school that stopped an entire presentation called Harlem on my mind. I guess you all forget this. And that one poem in an entire expose was used to stop everything and everyone connected there too was labeled anti-Semitic. There's another factor that I find very difficult to understand and it wouldn't go away. We can come to a place, any one of us, Dr. Scobie, Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Smalls, everybody. And then it's a pity that we got to say doctor for you, for you all to respect us. But what the biggest of my problem is that we can come and speak to you for as many hours as we do and, the la and we will speak on economics, we will speak on engineering, science, law, you name it. But the first question would be, do you believe in God? Isn't Islam better or Christianity better or Judaism better or something like that than so and so? I don't understand you because the point is you had God so many years and you still got the same problem. So the, the solution obvious isn't God, Allah, Je Jehovah or any one of the names. You must understand that God don't deal with the thing that you're talking about. There is no way that God is going to solve what's going on because God is too busy with the problem that today he had to stop the, the snow, it got to the point that he said, I've got that, that much snow, then he can't worry with you, <laughs> and he got snow to take care of, can't worry with you, and he got the sun to make sure the sun come up or don't come up, and things like that, to, to, you you're so damn important that God is watching you uh, kissing a sister and, you, and you're not married, or God is watching you uh, stealing a hamburger, uh, and and and, and, and gonna go put gonna put you down in the book. Now who the hell you think you are? <laughs> and what do you think God? They it, got two billion Chinese that God got to look at. <laughs> see, and all at the same day, at the same moment, you see God looking at two billion Chinese plus you. <laughs> You, you mean you're not rational. And, and, and when people ask you to be rational, then you get perturbed about it and figure that the ultimate part of your problem is the fact that that person doesn't believe in God and uh, or the person believes that God is a woman. That's the worst part of it. And, uh, and all these kinds of things that have nothing at all to do with your struggle. Because if, if it did, 
as much as you have gone to God. And it, nobody else in the world has gone to God more than African people. And nothing has happened. That don't mean there is no God. I didn't say that. But it means that God don't deal with the nonsense you're talking about. Got no time to waste with that. Too important. God got time to deal with his woman. And when she come with his, her, her problem. And even that you can't give God a chance to deal with. You believe that God will make woman. Huh? Brothers. And go provide you with a woman. And he got none. <laughs> I mean, see, even 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 there, even even there, we can't be rational. So to be, so we decide that God will be uh, 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 unisexual. He will masturbate rather than have sexual intercourse. That's another thing. We can't even let God have a woman. And then we, we then at the same time, oh man, I believe in Egypt. I, I'm done with the Egyptian thing. But all the Egyptian gods had goddesses. Every one of them. Not one of them masturbate when he wanted sex. They were never a stupid Egyptian god. All of them. So the first thing we need to do is to be rational in our behavior and to act thus. Rationality call, you see, most of us, whether we Christian or, or Muslim, take the basic tenets of our belief before we know about Egypt from the Hebrew Torah. Well. But every time we see that at least one branch of the Hebrews, something happened to them physically, they act for God with God's blessing. Let us go to your Bible, because I know you, you got to have some reference back to it to make you feel safe that the ceiling don't fall on you. <laughs> but in your Bible, Genesis 1, let's start from the beginning. Your Bible, have, your God have accepted genocide and Holocaust depending on who is committing it. I refer you, and some of you may have your Bible with you, to take it out and go to Genesis where God gives the land of Canaan to his chosen people because of a promise he had made to Avram, to Abraham. And to do this, there were people on the land of Canaan. As a matter of fact, seven nations of people. The Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and all of them. And that the chosen people kill every last one of those people of Canaan. Every, not even a dog or a cat was left standing. Because they were Canaanites. No other reason. So that God was involved in genocide and this Holocaust along with his chosen people. That's the God that you love. God didn't behave that way alone. Let's go now from there. Let's go to uh, Numbers. First chapter, first word. These are the ordinances I place before you. When you buy it and Hebrew slave, God talking to his chosen people. You must bring him to the door and register him and so forth. But when you buy a non-Hebrew, you must take him to the doorpost and bore his ears with an awl. These are the people that are talking about people enslaved them when on record they're the first people to have slaves. And in your Bible, but you can't talk about it. The ministers forget about it. The rabbis forget about it. The imams, the sheikhs, all forget about it. Don't talk about it, but right there. Because God told them to do it. So then God is the first racist we must deal with. You're not ready for this. 
in serious business. Either you're ready to deal with that crack of God that has been presented to us all the time. Because one of our basic problems is our subjugation mentally by the foreign god or goddess which we worship. And until we can relieve ourselves of the master's deity, male or female, we will not be able to overthrow the shackles that bound us. Mental shackle as well as physical shackle. The question generally comes behind this. Do you believe in God? I do. And she was a very good woman until she died. That's mama. That is hard for someone to understand because they forget that I have the right to my concept of a God or not. I have the right to be an atheist. That has nothing to do with my being an African. That is my individual decision to make. Whether, whether I believe in God or not has nothing to do with whether I kill you for messing with my son, or, or for, I kill you for messing with my mother, or my wife, or, or whatever it is. If you think so, then check me out. Does it mean I'm good because I believe in God? How many people don't know, brothers you don't know, believe in God but haven't supported their child one day? Well. How many brothers you don't meet in jail with all kinds of symbols and he knock off a sister, sell drugs to a little brother? But he believe in God, what, believe in God what it means? What does it mean? It is a hill of beans. Doesn't mean that that's a good person because they believe in God. I remember with a kid, People used to say on Sundays, okay, you cost me today, but today is Sunday. Tomorrow, get your ass. <laughs> so it'll be good for Sunday, but Monday, down to Saturday. <laughs> and it comes from another illusion and delusion which we suffer. I could be a stinker to the worst degree, but if I say, God forgive me just before I croak, and mean it, I, become, I go to heaven. But the guy who has been good all his life, or the sister, but never said, I believe in Jesus, or I believe in Jehovah, I believe in Allah, that person is forever going to have something bad happen when they die. And that is part of our, of our, our dilemma. Because when I look to you, my neighbor, my brother, my comrade, fighting with me at the battle line, you are looking to me not as a comrade on the battle line. You're looking to me as a man who did not make a peace with your concept of a deity. Therefore, you, you will shoot me probably far, quicker than the, the man I'm fighting. Or we are fighting. And we have to pass that stage. What we are doing in terms of Dr. Jeffries and others, Dr. Clark and whoever involved, to my understanding, is bringing to you a concept of a deity. Our deity doesn't have to be something to pray at or to. But it is something that you must be a part of and dedication. History in of itself is not an entity apart from other things. No more than the scientist or the, the doctor who treats the air, or one who specializes on the nose, doesn't, is not a person equally specializing in the human being. Because he's a specialist in your ear, or on your nose, or even on your fingers. 
does not say that he is not dealing with your body. Because if I take your ear and your fingers and say walk down the street, ears and fingers, it isn't going nowhere. You need the rest of the body, at least most of the rest of the body. So we got to think in terms of that. I try to, what I'm trying to do is to present uh, in very simple terms because we feel that this highfalutin, uh, what they call it, classical scholarship, and I don't know what the hell it is, uh, no more than I know what classical music is. It just, it just means somebody's music, and they put a label on it, and they, and they put it, uh, uh, all the aroma around it, and they say it's better than somebody else and become classical. Well, then any music is classical. You just say it is. And you put your aroma around it and their, your halo, and you're doing classical music. That's another thing. I heard some classical music just tonight. Sparrow. <laughs> yeah. 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 What, what is less about Sparrow's music? I said it's classical, and it is. I mean, uh, let's take Brahms and so forth. What's more classical? That's their music come out of their culture. And it, it started as a folk, 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 folkloric. That's how what happened, and they said, this is classical. Every culture has a classical music. The best within that culture is its classical music. And every people have that. Even if it's one man hitting a drum. And the people said, that's the greatest man playing a play drum. That's a classical <coughs> musician. But we don't see that. If the Europeans say it's classical, we have a different opinion of what the highest, that's how they say saying, is the highest in the value of our culture. But we have a different thing that is not only that, it is something that goes beyond what the words say, the semantics, and we see it as something involving with the deity and totally immersed in something, quote unquote, esoterical. It's no longer in the exoteric uh, information which we deal. That means stupid big words, but let me try to break that down because we don't all have to know that stupidness. Uh, esoterical, we call it something beyond your, your ability to totally comprehend without looking for something outside to give you some sort of idea. And then other one, exoterical, I mean plain old common sense. You know, you do it by plain old common sense. The latter is the better by the way, because you're going to jive yourself uh, or, or nobody else. But sometimes I got to show the, 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 the reason for coming to one of these classrooms and spending my money. <laughs> <laughs> now, in saying the latter, one of the points we still find is that we have not made, we're supposed to make it an ASCAC. We were looking for the fusing of two groups within our African body. The quote, quote intellectuals and the quote unquote common man, brother, sister, whatever. And we still haven't been able to fuse this link. And since the the um the the the, the United States uh, uh, Senate hearings and the uh, Justice uh, Thomas, the, the highlighting of the debate between this young lady and himself and others, sharpened us to a point where it is a, 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 um, the, the controversy between the bourgeois the, or other names you may call the talented tent and the so-called masses or people and I have something about that I always say that the masses are asses <laughs> and I do believe the masses are asses because given a piece of food the masses will show allegiance when I grew up uh, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, St. Croix mostly, and when there was a political camp campaign, there was a man named Penthony. He was of European stock, the, uh, 
uh, Danish European stock. And he was always win in the legislature. All he did, about two days before election, he killed two bull. Then they roast the bull. And they had all kind of sugar water and uh, lemon, you know, lemonade and all this and bread and at a place called Anna's Hope free. You, you, they send the buses to bring you and, and all of a sudden he'd be running behind but the people got bread and bull. <laughs> and it swung the vote and Penteny would win 90 to 1. <laughs> and if there ever was a bastard, it was Penteny. Cornelius Penteny. He, could, he did anything he want. He beat people. He shot a man named Daisha. He, he did whatever he wanted. Never got even a fine or a reprimand. Because he killed a bull. Just before election, each election. And the people went for Cornelius Penteny. Didn't belong to a political party. Nothing at all. Alone. Until everybody started to kill bull. Then he was no longer unique and he lost his first election. <laughs> because the masses, asses masses, had given, had given their, their value for a piece of bull meat. Which they bought on Sunday, but now they're getting free. Once a year. Don't, doesn't the mass... Or don't the masses behave the same way here? Yes. Yes. Huh? Yes. Somebody ask you, and they will say to us, well, you know, we don't get this because we don't vote. I don't vote, and I ain't vote in the past. I vote one time for Roosevelt, and that was a goddamn mistake. <laughs> Roosevelt, after my vote, put an embargo on materials going to Ethiopia to fight Italy. Ah. And since then, I didn't vote. For what? Well, you should vote. Why? What did you know? Change because of vote. Those of you who have voted, since you could vote, you voted. What changed? Your rent kept going up. Right. Your food bills went up. Yes. Your education for your children went up. So. They went and killed your own people. Yeah. All, right. All they did is send your son to die for some killing somebody else. You even tried to kill Saddam Hussein, and Washington is still there. Yeah. So isn't the ma isn't the masses asses? Yeah. Our behavior prove it because every little thing that the ma white man set up that is supposed to solve the problem, we don't investigate it. We said yes, we must join it. If in the morning, white people said, 50 of us will commit suicide every 10 minutes, there will be a black group. The Harlem committing suicide 10 minutes group. <laughs> Here, we will not, we will not. About uh, 10 years ago, there were, white, there were white groups, teenagers, committing suicide by arrangements. And black students on the campus fought, protested, went to the deans and so forth, demanding that they have the right to be in those organizations. And a number of black students committed suicide in that program that young white, white kids have started. We've done it. We, the, the, the adults have done the same thing. There is nothing, uh, fraternities, sororities, anything... Uh, we got, we have the cotillion, huh? the slaves doing cotillion for the, the same cotillion the masters did. We didn't ask if a cotillion is against our interest, and we could see there was nothing in the cotillion for our interest. It was, the cotillion was, was and still is nothing but a prostitution uh, institution. It tells when my daughter is ready to be laid for the highest, for the highest bidder. Right? But we didn't stop. When even most Europeans in the South no longer have cotillion, we still have cotillions. And all it does is make a few more girls pregnant that would have been pregnant that particular night. 
it tells me that I must let my daughter be in a hotel by herself, have a room, and then trust her like hell. You can tell me all you want about that. One person's daughter who is going to be in that hotel room, paid by me, testing her with these kind of maniacs out here in the street, is going to be my daughter. She's going to be there. Okay? So I had to start this way before I go into any historics in terms of buildings and pyramids and temples and, and all that. Because you had a lot of that. You could get up and give that lecture. If you go back deeply into all the lectures you've heard. But what happened with all that we have heard and still uh, there is still an attack or attacks verbally and otherwise on Dr. Jeffries. The reason it, it is is because we haven't been ready to die. We haven't had a showdown. Uh, there is still, when Farrakhan or Jeffries or so come on campus, Jewish students could come up and say, well, you white Jewish students, I've got to let you know because they are black Jewish students, could come and stop or deter or obstruct their tweaking on campus. But the black students have yet to deter or stop a white Jewish uh, lecturer on campus. Why? Because we have not yet decided that our life and our belief cannot be separated. We have developed from the church, and even those of us who are mostly Muslim or Hebrew, or Hebrew is like whatever we want to call ourselves, in the Baptist church, in the Pentecostal church, and so forth, we develop within there a syndrome of asking the same cracker God to do our bidding for us. And we are not ready yet to leave the cracker God and do our bidding for ourselves. And realize that whether there is a God or not, and I reserve the right on that, there are the things that we must do for ourselves. We, we would simultaneously say that God said, I'll help those who help themselves, but then go right back to pray. If God say, you must help yourself, then what the hell are you praying about? Just go ahead and help yourself. The proof of the matter two days ago coming from South Africa. Crackers get afraid that they heard a whole scale civil war. I wouldn't even call it civil war. Civil war must mean that I was with a fellow in a government and I decided to break away from him and fight, fight him. I'm, the Africans are not in any government with Europeans because it was a handful of Europeans deciding whether or not, and that was its sufficient excuse me, people, I'm going to talk about God. Because Mandela, will he help me? God may he help me, who has become God lately. And nobody can say anything about Mandela. But I said it from the day he was released on Gary Bird's show. The only thing that Mandela's freedom meant was Minnie no longer had to worry about a man and he didn't have to mis masturbate. That's the only thing his release meant to me. Since I'm a PSC man. You see, I don't forget very easily. And for all of you that run with Mandela, I will ask you, who, is the, who collects the money? Who is the treasurer of the organization? Who is the head of the army? All right then. And did he go to jail because of African principles, or he go to jail, went to jail and legal technicalities? Was he a dashing, raving, uh, uh, a nationalist? No, none of that. He didn't go to jail for any of that. 
But there were people 11 months before he came there, came out with him. Nobody said anything for the PSC. But then again, you, being integrationist, you couldn't help yourself. He represent the integrationist policy of a group of Africans who could not see themselves freeing themselves and being independent by themselves. And that is the thing that we have lost sight of. We have lost sight of that from holding Roberto in the Congo, or what was then called the Congo. We lost sight of that, that even the young brother who started out right Thank you. in Angola, but lost his way because of des desperation and joined with the crackers in South Africa, if you know the story. We saw the same thing with a group called Odena Odemano, Odenamo in Mozambique and Filemo equally fighting with Mandelan and his European wife in Mozambique. And that element of African got nowhere within the society. The same thing that happened in Haiti. The killing of the revolution. When Christophe had the proper answer. That some had to be killed. But you can't see people be dying. You talk about revolution, but you can't see anybody dying in the revolution. I don't know what kind of revolution you're talking about. In a revolution, mothers will be killed by son, sons going to be killed by mothers, and daughters will be killed by mothers, and, and et cetera, et cetera. That's war. And you're not dealing with it. When they call a person a terrorist, doesn't a terrorist call another one a terrorist? Didn't Begin call people terrorists? Didn't this present prime minister call people? What did they do? Did they terrorize anybody ever in their life? We forget the terrorist is the one who is fighting the, the, the existing government. The existing people in power labels those fighting them as ter terrorists. And those fighting them label themselves freedom fighters. Okay? So it's a matter of semantics. And what I've been doing from 1939 to now is trying to bring to my people alone. You may call it racism if you want. You may call it all kinds of bias. Yes, I plead guilty. I was trying to be racist. I was trying to be biased. I was trying to be anything you call it. Like other people. Since I realized that the only people got anything are the people who fought for themselves alone. Yeah. I'm not asking to be, do, be any different because all through the history that I've read, people must decide for themselves and go for themselves and set their values, even the value of beauty. Up to now, when you look among us in the struggle, we don't have a value of beauty. We don't know. We have no concept of what beauty must be. If you ask me to run a beauty contest right now in this room, and I ask you now, let's vote. What is going to be the standard of beauty? What kind of hair? How long it should be? What kind of nose? How short, how broad, how wide? We got no idea. We have no idea. Because we have not, we read Blyden. We read Dr. Blyden. But still, we read him, but can't remember what he said about the value of beauty. That beauty is set by the African woman. It doesn't mean that other women are ugly, but for the African people, the, that African value is the criteria. Not that anything is worse. We're not talking about better or worse. We're talking about the value. What value do we have that we consider our goal? And we have to, I think, start to deal with these things 
in critical dimensions because as we know we have seen a part of our pride in the 70s and the 60s that should have been now came reached tremendous height and disappeared our women's hair because we couldn't say that's her hair no we had to have a title for it so we call it the afro and since all titled uh, 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 things must come and go that the people of the South Pacific the people of Africa the people of other places never call their woman hair any name it's just it's her natural hair what is that? Her natural hair. Isn't that the Africa? No, it's Africa. What's that Afro? <laughs> by the way, Afro, see, we gone there to again. Just even that. Now we're back to, we're going back. We, one time, Jesse Jackson didn't know that, uh, that Garvey and uh, uh, people way back in the title, Chief Sam and what, Delaney and things, were using um, African American. Uh, but he, he hit at it. And it sounded good to him, he said it, and everybody said Jesse Jackson said it. Well, poor uh, brother down in, in, brother, um, in, um, in, in, in Temple, brother Masanti, doesn't know that Afro-American was used uh, for a long time. I guess you should know, but that, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what a guy named used it quite extensively, um, uh, the Lincoln's little boy, uh, Great man who became Lincoln's little boy. And after becoming Lincoln's little boy, lost his respect. See, I, I, I hate a lot of people, that, and, you, and you all don't like me because I don't pull the punch. You see, Douglas left from being a great man and became a Negro. When Lincoln gave him that beaten up by a woman who couldn't get a man after her husband died. You all forget now, he's, he left from being an African and became a colored man. Introduced the concept of colored people. Great man, great man with a great speech at Rochester, New York. What does the Negro have to celebrate on the 4th of July? That same man, given a beat up widow who couldn't find another man in Washington. Given a job in Washington, suddenly becomes a colored man and resigned from his people in Philadelphia. But we have it all the time. And we have it all the time because we do not have within ourselves the standard of beauty. A standard of beauty. And the reason we don't have a standard of beauty, we can't establish the standard of beauty because all of us, including me, will feel that, well, I don't have the shade, I don't have the nose, I don't have the figure, something wrong about me. Therefore, since I can't be the standard, I will not let her, him, be the standard. And then, you see what I'm saying? We can't set the standard because we may not qualify because of the raping that happened with us. Right. And all of us have been raped, even if it's jet black. Right. It just happened to the gym pool in your case. Didn't get messed up like in my case. Or in somebody else's case. But you've been raped. Don't, don't, don't go wrong saying, well, all right, my mama didn't get raped because look at me, I look like charcoal. Your mama got raped just that the genes didn't act up as somebody else's genes. You mean the auto raping must have been the way earlier, and they want further supply of that gene pool. You no. <laughs> see, so she went back. Uh, and then there is the that's another error again that all black people are jet black originally. No, oh, no, nonsense. But we have to do that. Now I go get a little, little historics and try to bring it down for you to ask more questions and I try to attempt to answer them if I can. Again, we need now, 
we have been given you have, you have been given a dose of egypt and egyptians and i hope that you do not become as many have already became in believing that egypt is the originator of african high culture to the contrary Egypt on the Nile was the last of the African high cultures. But it's where the zenith. Make sure that we understand what I'm saying. I'm saying Egypt became the greatest of the African high culture along the Nile, but was not the first but the last. Like the river Nile and its attributes, whether it be the blue Nile, the white Nile, the Atbara River, like it, the water flow from south to north. Equally did this high culture or civilization flow in the same direction. Thus, when we think of the African, the one to be given credit, if credit is, must be given, who gave us Egypt, you must think of what a great Egyptian himself wrote, and very few of the ancient Egyptians and other Africans placed their names on any of the current propaganda as of that, those days. But Hunefa, the high priest, told us, we, the Egyptian, came from the beginning of the Nile, where God happy dwells at the foothill of the mountain of the moon. We came from Central East Africa. That's what he's saying. At least, the basic conglomerate of Africans in those days was centered around there. They was dispersed from that centroid area. Let's just give a, a little broad perspective of the area. We can include, based upon Hunefa, Ethiopia, one place where the Blue Nile started, Uganda, where the White Nile started. But then, by virtue of archaeological finds, by virtue of the digging which gave us the fossil find, the oldest in the world, namely Denkmesh, which Westerners call Lucy, and Zinchanto was Boise, and others going back as far as 3.2 million years. Now, you, you can see. Now, stop here. And the first part, I know you are, many, many of you are angry with me for the things I'm saying. And I don't blame you. You, you. The way you have been trained for such a long time, you're supposed to be. But then you can't be now when I'm speaking of 3.2 million years as against... 6,000 years. If you're talking about the origin of man, and all you do is going back to 6,000 years, and I'm talking about 3.2 million, how can you deal with that origin as against mine? It's like me telling you, I'm older than my grandmother. <laughs> But you got to still <laughs> say, well, mathematically it makes sense, but I got blind faith. That's the problem, you blind faith. You don't even stop to ask yourself, what is faith? Faith is a mystery. 
That's the only mystery I know. Faith is saying, in spite of evidence, in spite of everything that I see, I know that the moon is made out of green cheese. <laughs> I got faith. Well, we have to understand carefully then, we must now go to study those areas. We must now go to study the Twa, the Hutu, the Sebenetos, the Grimaldi, the Kalahari, the Khoikhoi people. Probably those names, you have heard them, but you have heard, not heard them as much as you've heard the European use for them like pygmy and butchman or hottentot and what not. Well, if, using those words equally, if that we must do. We must go and study them because we are talking about source. I'm not talking about even roots, because that's for nonsense. It's about time that we deal, and I'll like speaking about the quality of our information has to be beyond criticism. Thus, when we talk about heroes and heroines, we must be able to put up a Harriet Tubman against a, this woman for the NWCP here, <laughs> here's the Dukes. There's no way in the, in the world you're going to use the same name in reference to honor among African people. There's no way we can consider the Buffalo Soldiers among the honorable African people. There was a time where we needed them because we didn't even know we had heroes or heroines. And so we took them. But now that we know better, there is no way that you can tell me that you could wear a, a Nefertiti bus and a chain. Especially those of you who have been to Egypt, you can't justify it as against a Nefertari. I don't care if you spend the money. I've spent money and find out I make mistake. And I get rid of the thing or melt it down, sell it, do something like it. If I made a mistake, then I can't say, well, I pay good money for it. Yeah, I know you pay good money for it. But by wearing it, you're exhibiting your assessness, your ignorance. And it must be said. You can't continue to wear it because you put your money. Is your money then greater than the integrity as Tony, as Tony um, um, brothers raised first? Tony Martin, brother Tony Martin asked, your integrity. Huh? Somewhere down the line, when I see you, I don't only see a woman or a man. I see African integrity. When I look at you, sure, you're a sex object when you're a sister. I'm a, I'm a consider, I always look at you as a sex object. I ain't woman, woman earth. They, they, they're sick people. Say, oh, we, we no sex object. Where the hell you look like a woman for? If, if I am a man, I look, I look at a woman, and you're not a sex object, it means you ain't got much going for you. <laughs> you understand? Any African woman that tell me, I'm not a sex object, I said probably for a woman, but for a man, you're a sex object. You understand? So I don't want to hear you sisters saying, I am not a sex object, but where, where the hell are you? Piece of guava? I mean, what, what? Uh, any, any brother, uh, the brothers, I mean, maybe you could correct me. When you see a woman, 
Do you see her for her brain? First time you see her, I'm seeing her brain. No. No. When I see a woman, I'm looking to see her breast line. I'm looking to see, you know, if, if, my, if I got penetrating eye, I'm looking to see her waistline. And if, if I could see her from the rear, I'm looking to see her behind. Okay? When I pass that stage, then I'm worrying about brain. You understand? Because I can't see no brain when I look at her. First, I see and recognize her as a, as a sister, beautiful specimen. <laughs> and then she could whip the brain on me. You understand what I mean? But I'm not going to lie to satisfy uh, uh, some art, woman's art, or what the hell they call it, and lie to myself and tell, oh no, I, I don't have a macho. I don't know what's macho. If you mean that, uh, that do I get stimulated when I see a black woman? Yeah, you're damn right. Not only stimulating, I get ready. <laughs> and I am not embarrassed, embarrassed about that. If I didn't get ready, something wrong with me. Or oh, something wrong with a sister. She can't move nobody. <laughs> she need to get some surgery, plastic surgery, to move somebody. You understand? That has nothing to do with me not appreciating her. I appreciate her. Why? I do. I ask, ask my wife. I used to go to the funeral home and pick up roses and things to carry home for my wife. <laughs> But them dead people didn't need no roses. And my, and my, there's no shame about it. None of them dead, not one of those dead people come in the house yet. When the guy is dead, he was finished. If he, was, if he could do anything, then he'd get off his behind and stop being dead. But because he was finished, or she was finished, I took the, the roads to people who was alive and could use it. I, I, I recircled the roads. <laughs> now, what what it mean is this, what you overlook is the thought. When I went home and said, darling, I brought you these roses. Look at what I have been doing to a sister, an African sister. I made her happy when she might have been feeling very bad that day. I changed her whole disposition. She saw me as her beautiful, uh, her, her handsome, I take that, her handsome husband, her caring husband and everything. She might have born to fire me that day. She didn't fire me no more. <laughs> she might have, you know, she cooked the food better, add a little bit of salt or something uh, when I was in the bathroom. But it, it make that difference. Now, you are seeing the dead person and you can't see dead people carrying the flowers. Why not? He wasn't coming complaining. I wasn't complaining. And she took the flowers with all happiness. After I told her, that was, I tell, eventually tell her that when she asked me why you don't bring roses anymore, I said the funeral parlor moved. <laughs> so, <laughs> and of course, she reacted like you. You brought me dead flowers and said, those flowers were alive. The guy was dead, but the flowers were alive. No, no, it, 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 that's what happened, is that you're going to wait, you're going to, I didn't have the money to afford live flowers. Huh? And, and, and all of those roses and, and chrysanthemum and all those things look pretty live to me. And it did to her. A lot of sisters would like you to bring some dead roses to them. It will make them feel good. Don't tell them the person died, you get the roses. Because then they're scared of dead people anyhow. Okay.
But the main, uh, uh, lastly, what I couldn't help but end in this way. Everywhere I go, in terms of convention, etc., I don't see a lovingly caressing feeling among African men and women. I go to these conventions and sisters are sitting in a little pool here, brothers in a little pool here, at the convention of African people. No change. What is going on in the general public comes to the convention. And our behavior remains the same though we are speaking. Quite to the contrary. We, there is no feeling of that affection between male and female which the African is so capable of and should be doing. We still have to beseech brothers, if we say brothers and sisters hold hands, the only time we're willing to do it is if we're going to pray. We can't hold hands to be affectionate without sexual. That, that, that when we talk about love, to us it means sexual intercourse. Like we say, man, last night, I love her. What do you mean you had sex with a sister? Huh? No kind of feeling of respect and the love that we talk about is socially is solely one that we see on the television and we hear in the songs that is the, the, the most bestial with no inner feelings at all thus it is that we can't come to the convention, sister comes up with a taxi, a group of sisters in a taxi, because we have not yet reached the point where brothers could bring sisters, or a brother could pick up a sister. We are still afraid. Sisters are still afraid of brothers, though we are in organizations such as this. I don't think Dr. Jeffries could pick up a sister at the bus station unless she give it a second thought. Even though belong to this organization or vice versa. Sister says, come on brother, I'll drive you up to the, you, I, think I, I thought I saw you the last time. Don't, aren't you going to the meeting up there? Yes, sister, but, but, but what? <laughs> we haven't reached to that point yet. If I said, a sister, the, the, we haven't, I'm going down to Philadelphia, we haven't, a, there's a big thing going on there. I, we have not reached the point yet where I could say, come on sister, I'm going down. She has to ask me, well, where am I sleep? Right. She cannot say that I am the kind of man, if I tell her to go, I know that I have to buy a hotel room for her like I buy one for myself. She knows that I haven't reached that stage yet. She automatically know that I'm thinking that I'm expecting her to sleep in my king size or my queen size. At least she don't expect me to have two beds in the room, a double. It's going to be my king size. I may even try to get a bed, a smaller bed, to make sure that she could be close. I want to protect her. Because nothing in my mind is figuring I'm going to spend an extra dollar to get her own place, her own door, that I would consider her integrity against scandal. She hasn't yet been able to see me in that light. So that if I take her to the movies, and then I drive up at home, she's afraid to say, 
would you like a cup of coffee? I know you spend the whole day with me because you know when I get upstairs I can't behave. I want something for my money I just spend. And, it, and, and, it, and I'm talking about among us in these organizations. We have, not, we have not come to the point that a sister can trust me if the lights went out here and a sister feel my hand on her shoulder, she going to scream in here right now because she has not yet learned to respect me because I have not given a reason to respect me that way. That is a, that's a shame. We're going to have 3,000 Dr. Jeffries can't change that. We must get to the point that the African woman see me and see that brother and that brother and when she sees me she sees her salvation. She sees her defense, her protection. She know that she can come and lie down here and don't have to pull her dress down that she isn't going to be molested by me. She has to she has to gain that confidence again that I have enough knowledge and respect for her knowing that I'm not her man and therefore will not take the liberties of her man. That I am her friend, her brother. She hasn't reached that stage and that is something we got to work on. We cannot take laurels of the fact that we know our history well. Yes, it's good, but besides knowing our history, what has knowing our history done for me in terms of that sister? In terms of that sister, can that sister said he knows his history and I could bring him to my a house. He got put out and say, hey Ben, here is a room and don't put a lock and key on her door and have to lock it with a bar. Huh? She has to put on, she got to wear jeans uh, and a lock and key. And keep 911 handy. No, it's, we got to, we, we have got to go to that point. Beyond just um, knowing herself. Most of us know ourselves already. But we have to be able to demonstrate that we know ourselves. And part of that knowing ourselves is our respect for our women. And obviously, vice versa, the woman's respect for the brother. We've got to go to that point that we come as brothers and sisters, yes, in the capacity of each other. Though some of us will be man and woman, husband and wife, all that. But the relationship that we have with each other must be one of understanding and, and we don't overgo the bounds of those understanding out of respect. Love is one thing. And as I said before, any beast love, any man, I could fall in love with a prostitute in the, in the gutter lying down with the filth running around her. And you will say, I can't understand what Yosef found with a woman lying down in the gutter. You can't understand. It's an emotion I can't understand. But you know Yosef don't love the, don't respect the woman. I love her, but don't respect her. I love her because it's an it's a emotional uh, uh, obsession that I can't control. But I'm not going with her looking like that. At least I'm going to start to somehow get the feast it off, go brush it off, that indicate that I don't like it there. I'm bashful, I'm ashamed of it. Right? But at the same time, I can't keep away from her physically. So then, the highest emotion that we got to deal with is the respect for each other. Mm -hmm. And that, and until, and we must work towards consciously, there must be exchange between us as men and women to develop this posture and pass it on particularly to our youngsters. Our young men need to know this from our women, mothers and whatnot, and our young daughters need to know that from the fathers and whatnot. 
we have to transfer this to our youngsters because and lastly really lastly we cannot tolerate the killing I mean to think of a youngster coming with a gun to kill another even a girl to think that a young African man will get up in the in right here and call an African woman bitch hey bitch come here and to think that she will say yes I am his bitch then I have to ask you what progress we make in the reason Dr. Jeffries is in such dilemma is that we ourselves have not reached the point of respect for each other that he could feel that secure it shouldn't be that Dr. Jeffries had to walk with bodyguard wherever he goes there should be bodyguards there waiting that I you the next person is a bodyguard when they saw him when we see him we will say there he is and we stop and guard him but then to do that it would be that we feel the kind of love that I'm talking about the love that the Haitians had with it with the with the war against France where the best of lady of Haitian went with a French soldier gave her body physically to get him in bed just to plunge a knife in him that was the kind of love the Haitian woman at that time had and the Haitian men for each other she gave her dignity to the French man just to put a knife in him oh, she went all the way that's the kind of love that we have to develop uh, around a Jeffries, around uh, any one of us that uh, have been threatened by another group. And until, until we have reached the stage that we can feel that kind of love, I may use another word, if I, if I, the semantics doesn't really matter, but until we fire, feel that emotion between us, that hold us together in the struggle for our freedom even the history that we are rally around and our, the knowledge of self that we rally around self would not have been accomplished unless we reach the point that your life is my responsibility and my life is yours thank you